Forest Base Beekeeping is attractive. It's a good fit for this area because at the moment, um, beekeepers have to import queens from Hawaii. The cosmetic companies import wax from Africa because our own beeswax is contaminated with pesticides. And the bakery industries import honey from China and Argentina. And so what I hope and what we're all working toward is a way to make this region an economic tiger with five different tails. You have honey production, which is the obvious one, but wax production is just as important. Queen bee production is getting a lot more important because so many states now have African honeybees so that Appalachian queens can be a biocontrol for people throughout the region. Um, of course, then you have pollination services this is a great place for them to cut their teeth. And then, um, and then extension services, you know? So beekeeping can be both vocational uh, based, but it can also be knowledge based economies. Because if I just go trying to break. Dr. Tammy Horn is the author of Bees in America and Bee Economy What Women and Bees Can Teach Us About Local Trade and the Global Market. Her family background in beekeeping and her extensive research led to the creation of Coal Country Bee Works in 2008. The partners, which include coal companies, educators, reforestation groups, and beekeepers, are working together to provide habitat and care for honeybees, as well as promote good land use and a new economy in the mountains of eastern Kentucky. Our main objective when we started was to provide Dr. Horn with a place to do her research and on the honeybee and the habitat. In 2007, when I first met Dr. Horn, we were just beginning to hear about colony collapse disorder and all the, the adverse effects of, of the stressors that were put on the honeybee. And as a result of that, nearly one third of all the, the honeybees were just disappearing and dying off. It didn't take me long to understand that, that this was a win-win situation for everybody involved. Coal Country Bee Works works with reforestation and, and forests are the lungs of our nation. And so it was really important to all of our partners that we have places that, that have a diversity of Appalachian trees back on, on these surface mine sites. Um, and so in 2008, then I started with Arch Coal and James River Coal. And the diversity of trees that got planted uh, were all Appalachian natives, you know, basswoods, sourwood trees, uh, the tulip poplars especially. As far as beekeepers are concerned, those are our big honey flows. And, and so what we wanted to do was to have a three season bloom you know, to have a, a, a spring and a summer and a fall season. And the sourwoods are particularly important for that because the sourwoods start blooming around the 4th of July in this region. And they don't, they don't quit blooming until like the end of October. And so the other thing that the coal companies didn't have to do, but they decided to do, was to also plant wildflowers. But because there is only one flowering tree in this region uh, in the fall, uh, a lot of the coal companies went ahead and supplemented that with goldenrods and sunflowers and asters. So at this time of year, it's interesting, the, the, the chemical makeup of the hives will change. You can actually smell the pollens that are coming in. Um, it makes for a yeasty kind of smell when they're bringing in the, the goldenrod pollen. So this site is different than my other sites because it is a little more hilly. Uh, we have them on a slope. It tends to be a, a healthier site than the others because it's geographically removed from what we would consider your, your conventional pesticides. You know, there are original beehives here. I like to use the brood from this particular yard because there's longevity and that's what we want. I mean, we're really trying to get a type of, of Appalachian bee genetic line started so that our beekeepers can begin to, to do queen production. The other thing that makes this a good site is that there is plenty of nutrition. 
We think that nutritional flaws are a big part of why there is um, declining numbers of bees. We think large industrial monocultural monofloral areas make bees weaker. So if you're looking around at this site, they have a lot of different things to choose from. This bee yard that we're on is the what we call the rowdy bee yard. It's actually on a site that was already reclaimed when we started this project. Uh, needed some, some wildflowers, it needed some buckwheat, it needed some sourwood trees. Uh, so we've come in and supplemented the plantings that, that were here in order to, to provide that three season bloom. This particular yard, it's not an active surface mining site. It's been out of bond for a good long time. They plant buckwheat in the field behind me, uh, sunflowers over on that slope, uh, wildflowers over in this field, and then there are mature sourwood trees and basswood trees in this forest line. I wrote a grant to do economic development and set up a queen production yard. Uh, and queen production yards are a little different than honey production yards. Uh, you want to have a lot of diversity of males uh, in the bee world. Those are called drones to mate with. For many people in this region, they're, they're like myself, you know, they had a grandfather who was a beekeeper. My grandmother from Harlan County was a beekeeper. They have aunts and uncles that were, were beekeepers. And so there's already a respect for beekeeping that I don't have to fight for. It's already part of the cultural code, if you will. Everyone loves the bees. Bees sell themselves. Everyone knows the losses that were taken. They know the hits that were taken. But our region can be really proud of the fact that we are separated from a lot of the, the pesticide drifts and fungicide drifts. Uh, and then again, we have this amazing diversity of floral uh, resources that we can benefit from. Economic diversity ultimately depends on landscape diversity. So we can be a part of bringing the bee populations back.